And I give you Mr. Roy Hunt. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to, I guess, a little mini series of uh, programs focusing on Marjorie Canan Rawlings and her farm, uh, people at Cross Creek. Last week you had uh, uh, a short documentary with Donna Green Townsend uh, about the creek and uh, uh, <coughs> Marjorie's neighbors. Um, Barbara Wingo talked about things that are going on, very exciting things this fall. Uh, but Flo Turcott, uh, and I hope I have the title right, is archivist for the Rawlings collection. She's also archivist for the Zora Neale Hurston collection. Um, <clears throat> I've known Flo for, I don't know how many years, 25 to 30 at least. And <clears throat> she has uh, been everything uh, in terms of Rawlings. Uh, she has served as president of the uh, Marjorie Canand Rawlings Society. Uh, I think she's CEO of the Friends at the moment. Uh, but um, there is not a single, there is no other person better qualified to tell us about the life and times of Marjorie Canand Rawlings. And so I turn it over to Flo. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see, in quotes, um, some of you. Thank you, Roy, for um, that introduction. Yes, indeed, I've been, uh, Roy and I have been friends. We, we met each other through our association with Rawlings and his interest in Rawlings. Um, I became curator of literary manuscripts here at UF in the libraries um, in 2005. And I knew, probably knew Roy even before that because um, I was, you know, interested in Rawlings and um, even before I took this position. So it's kind of a dream position. I, I love what I do. Um, I'm in charge of all of our literary manuscripts um, and Rawlings, um, as you will learn, is the flagship literary collection um, here at, uh, at the libraries with her her collection being manuscript collection number one of the um, of the creating writing series. In fact, she sort of established it, and I'll go into that a little bit um, in a little bit um, explaining some more about that. So um, I'm I'm excited to be here. I I love Rawlings, and as Roy indicated, it's been uh, there's quite a bit of activity that's going on. Um, on and about Rawlings this, um, this fall. And I'll tell you a little bit more. I know you've heard about um, the, um, the activities associated with the yearling, but I'm also gonna give you um, a preview of some other things that are going on um, with regard to the biographer of Rawlings. So thanks for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, my title is The Life and Times of Marjorie Canaan Rawlings. Uh, my not so hidden agenda is to talk to you also about a very special series of events that are taking place here in Gainesville and in Cross Creek and in Marineland um, on November 19th through the 21st. Uh, Anne McCutcheon, the author of the newish Rawlings biography, The Life She Wished to Live, a biography of Marjorie Canaan Rawlings author of The Yearling, will be coming all the way from Laramie, Wyoming to give three book talks here in a week or so. The first one on Friday the 19th will be limited to 50 people and will be in person at the Matheson History Museum. It will also be live via Zoom. I'll show you the, um, the details about these series of events um, at the end of the presentation. And I can send you um, via Julianne uh, the flyer that describes the, the different, how to register, et cetera. Um, books will be for sale at each one of these events in case you haven't had a chance to um, pick up the biography. So I'm, um, 
I'm a um, employee of the Special and Area Studies Collections Libraries Library at um, at George A. Smathers Library in the old Smathers Library building, and um, just this is just a um, sponsorship slide that shows you the the reading room and um, the building that we um, are housed in on campus. Our department is home to substantial holdings of rare print maps, archives, and manuscripts, as well as interdisciplinary co collections pertaining to geographical, national, or cultural regions. Our materials and personnel advance the university's research mission and spark the minds of our students. This is the mural from 1953 in our grand reading room. The primary focus of my job and our literary collections are authors who lived in and wrote about Florida. Two of our flagship literary collections are the Marjorie Canan Rawlings and Zora Neale Hurston papers. The two women were friends and we have the correspondence between them in the collections. I could do another presentation at another time about Zora Neale Hurston, but today we will focus on Rawlings. This is a photo of the first page and the entire manuscript of the 1939 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Yearling. Rawlings left her entire manuscript collection to UF after her death in 1953, and we have continued to acquire materials related to Rawlings ever since. The materials arrived here well cared for and have been fastidiously maintained over the years. So a little bit more about this manuscript coming um, later in the presentation. Marjorie Canan was born on August 8, 1896 in Washington, DC. A pensive and precocious child, she learned to read and write at an early age. At age 12, she won a $2 prize for a story published in the Washington Post. Her mother was Ida Trapp Hagen Canan. Marjorie had a tumultuous relationship with her, which she chronicled in a book called Blood of My Blood, which went unpublished until 2002. Her father was Arthur Frank Canan, an examiner in the US Patent Office. Frustrated by his bureaucratic career, he bought a dairy farm in Maryland and introduced Marjorie to his own appreciation for nature at a young age. He died in 1913 when Marjorie was only 16. The next year after Marjorie graduated from high school, she, her mother and younger brother, Arthur, moved to Wisconsin so she could attend college in Madison. Marjorie did very well at Wisconsin and entered Phi Beta Kappa her junior year. She was active in the theater troupe and enjoyed writing in the university's literary review. She fell in love with one of her fellow writers at Wisconsin, a young man by the name of Charles Rawlings. After graduation, Marjorie moved to New York City and Charles went to fight in the war. They were married when he returned from Europe and they moved to Rochester, New York to be near his family. After her stint in New York City, Marjorie hated the provincialism of Rochester. In 1928, they took a vacation trip on a steamer to Jacksonville and then up the St. Johns River to, say, to Island Grove, Florida, where they visited with Charles's two brothers who were trying to make a living prospecting orange groves. Marjorie instantly fell in love with the place and using her inheritance, she and Charles left Rochester behind and bought a dilapidated farmhouse and a neglected grove in Cross Creek. They moved in early November, 1928. Their intention was to sit and write while the oranges grew and made their living for them. Yeah, right. The first few years were extremely difficult. The couple had little time for writing. There was 
a, um, a freeze, a serious freeze. Uh, a lot of the crop was spoiled. They had, um, of course, the Great Depression descended. And with the scarcity of everyday necessities and the work that needed to be done on the farm, um, it was a real struggle. Marjorie nevertheless began to record her impressions of the surrounding countryside and the fascinating people in it. In March, 1930, she sold her first story, Cracker Chidlings, to Scribner's Magazine, and in December, her second, Jacob's Ladder. Through her association with Scribner's, she became the protege of Maxwell Perkins, beginning an editorial relationship and friendship with him that would be integral to her literary development and creative maturation. She once wrote to him, you have the knack of taking the imagination of another in the hollow of your hand. In 1931, she went to live for a while with a family in the Big Scrub, now known as the Ocala National Forest. She continued to write short fiction about her experiences and at the urging of Max Perkins began to write her first novel. South Moon Under was published in 1933, the same year she obtained a divorce from Charles Rawlings. The two had quarreled incessantly and Charles did not share in the inspiration that Marjorie got from Creek Living. Although Marjorie was faced with a tremendous challenge, being a woman living alone in the rural South during the Great Depression, South Moon Under was very successful and she began to enjoy her independence. She enjoyed entertaining and often staged fairly elaborate dinner parties in her Creek home. She had persistent problems with hiring and retaining servants and Grove help. Here are two of her more successful hires, Martha Miggins on the left and Idella Parker on the right. Um, if you have read Cross Creek, you may remember that Martha was the first to greet Rawlings and her husband on the, on her, upon her, their arrival. Idella later wrote a book called The Perfect Maid about her mixed experiences with Marjorie. Evidence suggests that Mrs. Rawlings was an exacting and sometimes difficult employer, but she managed to establish intimate and long-term connections with many of the African-American families at the Creek. Here's a photo of a group of Rawlings friends being entertained by the hired help at a soiree. Present at many of these parties was Marjorie's friend, Norton Baskin, a hotel man from Ocala. They were introduced through Marjorie's divorce lawyer. Norton and Marjorie, though very different, hit it off from the start. He was establishing a hotel and restaurant business in St. Augustine and Marjorie would often visit him there. They would enjoy an active social life and then she would force herself to return to the Creek to get back to her writing. At Max Perkins urging, she was beginning at this time to coalesce her ideas for a boy's book about life in the big scrub. If you look at the book called Max and Marjorie, you can read their letters back and forth with Max gently suggesting a different focus for the story as early as June of 1933. Marjorie had a different idea and was, what, and was working on what ended up being her second novel, Golden Apples. Under Max's gentle tutelage, Marjorie produced what was to be her most successful book, The Yearling, in 1938. She was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Literature for The Yearling, which was printed in many different languages. 
During World War II, armed services editions were printed that could easily fit into a soldier's pocket. And many of these um, uh, books are still in existence um, from the World War II period. Uh, as a result, Rawlings received hundreds of letters from servicemen, especially from those from um, Fl Florida and other Southerners who read the Yearling and found that it assuaged their feelings of homesickness during the war. Here's the original typescript of the Yearling bound into these volumes in 1990 when funding was obtained to preserve and make the manuscript available to future generations of scholars, researchers, and interested readers. Each page of the manuscript was encapsulated in mylar and bound into these nine binders, which were then put into custom made slip cases. The Mahoney family from Ocala donated the funds necessary for this massive project in memory of their son, Frank, who um, like many young people grew up in the Ocala National Forest area um, he was tragically killed um, in a, I think in a car accident in 1990. And he's always associated himself. I'm like the boy Jody, I grew up in the, in the scrub. And so his parents uh, donated this for this preservation work um, in his memory. Many, uh, many opportunities like this one exist for those that might be interested in taking on similar projects, either on a large or a small scale. Please contact me if you'd like to discuss this in further detail. As you may know, and as you will be seeing this next week, I believe you definitely know, the Yearling became a major motion picture um, in 1946. Um, here's Marjorie, um, a picture of Marjorie on the set at Salt Springs where some of the scenes were filmed um, the year before. Here's a, this is a map that I call the yearling country map. And it's a map of the Ocala National Forest from 1938. Um, Marjorie, it's really hard to see because it's um, very fine and the, the printing has been, um, has faded over time. But Marjorie sent this to the MGM crew um, when they were filming in order to sort of annotate the places where she imagined the scenes from the yearling taking place. For instance, one of them is the Baxter's um, uh, family cabin. Uh, another is the place where the fight with old Slewfoot took place, um, the Forester's family um, compound, et cetera. So, so in other words, she was like blending sort of what, what she saw and what she um, experienced with um, living with families in the big scrub in 19, early 1930s, 1930 and 1931 and then transposed that into her, through her imagination into the story of the yearling, which of course is fiction, but, but um, she thought it would be like necessary for MGM to um, actually film these different scenes in the places where she imagined them um, occurring. So very interesting kind of uh, insight into <clears throat> her creative process. Um, as well as sort of like, um, it wasn't realistic because obviously a lot of the scenes were shot in Hollywood on a, on a film set. Some things were, were shot here in Florida, um, but you had you know, lots of different uh, takes on it. But this was Marjorie, the way she, Marjorie imagined the film should be done um, by go, traveling to all these places out in the middle of nowhere um, to, uh, to film these scenes. With her success on the literary front, Marjorie had more time to enjoy her hunting and fishing activities. So here she is with um, 
her friend on a, a little skiff in at Salt Springs um, catching crab. She included Norton, her friend Norton, on many of these joints, jaunts, but he didn't share her true affinity for rod and rifle. This photo I think is funny because Marjorie's all, you know, decked out in her field clothing and, and Norton looks like he was just stepped out of the hotel lobby and um, slung a rifle over his shoulder to look like he was, he was tagging along for a hunting expedition. They were married in the fall of 1941 and soon thereafter, Norton went off to volunteer in the war effort in Burma. Marjorie put a lot of energy into writing letters to him while he was away, as many as three a day. These were published in a book called The Private Marjorie, edited by Rawlings scholar Roger Tarr. At the same time, Marjorie was putting the finishing touches on Cross Creek, a collection of short vignettes paying homage to her adopted home. This book too enjoyed almost immediate success and Rawlings had reached the pinnacle of her literary career. The homey stories provided solace to a war weary world. Hundreds of fan letters poured in, again, many from soldiers. Unfortunately, one of her subjects in Cross Creek, the census taker, Zelma Kaysen, took issue with Marjorie's portrayal of her in the book, which read as follows. Under the chapter five, the census. In 1930, my friend Zelma from the village was commissioned to take the census in the back country sections of Alachua County. Zelma is an ageless spinster resembling an angry and efficient canary. She manages her orange grove and as much of the village and county as needs management or will submit to it. I cannot decide whether she should have been a man or a mother. She combines the more violent characteristics of both and those who ask for or accept her manifold ministrations think nothing of being cursed loudly at the very instant of being tenderly fed, clothed, nursed, or guided through their troubles. In January of 1943, Kaysen entered a $100,000 lawsuit against Rawlings for libel. The charge was then changed to invasion of privacy after a ruling by the Florida Supreme Court. Litigation dragged on until in May of 1946, Rawlings won and the suit was dismissed. Kaysen appealed, however, and in 1947, the state Supreme Court overthrew the decision, stating that the book had caused Zelma injury by provide, per, parading her private life before the entire world. It awarded Zelma damages in the amount of $1 plus court costs, which amounted to about $10,000. Marjorie was devastated. She spent the summer in Van Hornsville, New York with some friends in order to escape the publicity and gather material for her last novel, The Sojourner, which she had been trying unsuccessfully to write since 1943. Soon after the trial, Max Perkins, her editor and mentor died suddenly and Marjorie plunged into a deep depression. She bought this old farmhouse in Van Hornsville and began to spend most of the year there and only winters in Cross Creek. The magic was gone from the enchanted Cross Creek and Marjorie's health was suffering greatly from a life of hard drinking, and smoking and the stress of the trial. 
she vowed to never again write about Florida. In 1950, she dedicated a new wing of the library at the University of Florida and established the creative writing collection with her manuscripts as the flagship, as I said, collection number one. As she put it, I feel that I have found a legitimate, a, a, a useful home for my illegitimate children to use a euphemism. I am now the proud caretaker of these illegitimate children that she refers to as her manuscripts. In 1952, she suffered a heart attack, recovered and finally finished The Sojourner in August. It was published the following January and received a lukewarm response. She began research on a biography of Ellen Glasgow in 1953, but died on December 14th of a cerebral hemorrhage in St. Augustine. She was buried in, in Antioch Cemetery near Island Grove, Florida, not far from Cross Creek. Visitors are welcome 365 days a year at her home in Cross Creek, now known as the Marjorie Canan Rawlings Historic State Park, a national historic landmark. The interpretive program there will transport you to a time when Rawlings lived and wrote there in the 1930s and 40s. They dress in period costumes. They, um, they have her um, a, a replica of her old car there parked in the, um, in the carport. And this table that Marjorie's sitting at is on the, um, on the front porch, just as it is here in this photo. I'd like to give you a quick preview of an upcoming publication. You know, I talked a lot about letters back and forth, um, and in particular, the book Max and Marjorie about the editorial relationship um, was very successful, and we. Um, University Press of Florida agreed to be to publish this book that that um, I edited along with colleagues Roger Tarr and Brent Kinzer, and this book um, will be coming out in um, next spring in April probably. Uh, this amazing collection of letters back and forth between Rawlings and her protege, and eventual literary executor Julia Scribner. Bigham, who was the daughter of her publisher, Charles Scribner. Was, this collection was donated to UF libraries a few years ago, and we jumped right on. It was fascinating stuff, and we, we um, uh, edited the letters and got them into a, um, a volume, and I hope you'll check it out when it comes out next spring. Speaking of upcoming events, I'd like to call your attention to this um, a series of book talks that Ann McCutcheon, as I indicated, will be coming from Wyoming to do a talk at the, here in the, at the Matheson Museum on Friday, November 19th. Um, there will be a live event that we're asking people to register ahead of, uh, ahead of time. So, because it's limited to, I think they're saying 50 people will be able to attend in person. And then there will be a Zoom link um, to um, be able to watch it online if you're not able to get a place um, at the Matheson. Uh, while she's here in town, we've arranged for her to be um, doing a reading outdoors at the Marjorie Cunan Rawlings Historic State Park on Saturday, November 20th. And that will be, she will be on the porch of the tenant house there in Cross Creek, weather permitting, and, um, and so attendance there is unlimited uh, because of the, because it will be an outdoor event. Um, she will also, the folks in, in um, Marine Land were clamoring for her to appear as well. So she's going to be going to uh, St. Augustine on um, the 21st on Sunday afternoon and doing another reading at Loman Auditorium there at the Whitney Lab. Um, 
And so all three events are sponsored by UF Libraries, by the Matheson, and by a generous um, stipend from Jack Davis and the um, Rothman Family Endowment uh, to get Anne here and to get uh, this information, uh, you know, to get to promote the book and to talk about Rawlings's life. So uh, Roy said I'm the expert, but Anne McCutcheon has also uh, done a great deal. She spent um, almost a year um, researching, more than a year actually, researching uh, Rawlings and um, has developed, she and I have developed a friendship. And I think this book is fantastic. If you wanna learn more about, about Rawlings, I recommend you read the book and or um, attend one of these events. I'm here to, here's my, my, um, my contact information if you want to um, ask me some more questions, but I'm also here. I'll stop sharing and put my camera back on and we can, um, I can answer questions. Thank you, Flo. Um, before the questions, I, I'd like you to confirm a story I've heard, which I think <laughs> is... Uh, wonderful, uh, in a way, about uh, Marjorie's burial. Um, I, I recall hearing, and you can confirm or, or deny this, that um, when Marjorie and her husband were on their way to the funeral of Tom Glisson, JT's father, um, and I think he's subject of one of the chapters in Cross Creek and the terrible death he suffered from drinking poison inadvertently. And when they got to that little country cemetery, Marjorie said, this is so beautiful and this is where I want to be buried. And when she died and uh, they were on the way to the cemetery, Norton realized that uh, it was the wrong cemetery. And what do you do about it at that point? So she ended up being buried a rather short distance, what, 30 feet from the woman who had sued her for invasion of privacy. Uh, so they were there together for eternity. Is that a true story? Yes, indeed. She had she had selected the, the Citra, uh, the cemetery in Citra to be buried. Um, and Norton being somewhat unfamiliar and and uh, having a poor sense of direction about these country different places um, was, you know, in the, it was, she died suddenly and Norton was flustered and flummoxed and they said, um, you know, uh, do you want her buried at the cemetery in uh, Antioch Cemetery in Island Grove, and that's where she was buried. He said, yeah, yeah, that's where I think Tom was buried. But then he noticed, and he didn't know this until he was actually in the hearse, you know, then they were going to bury um, Marjorie, that it was the wrong cemetery. And being a gracious Southern gentleman, he did not deign to uh, make a fuss and raise a ruckus about um, about that. So indeed, ironically, she is buried just a few feet away from um, her nemesis, who, according to legend, she also made um, uh, was reconciled with before she died. But that's sort of like it was. It was always awkward between them after the um, after the the lawsuit, and so there's varying stories on on whether or not she and and Zelma became friends again. Probably not, but at least reconciled to a certain extent, and now they lie there for all eternity. Okay. Marjorie's well, grave is like very interesting because it's a, a lot of people will go there, and if you go to Cross Creek and to her home, they'll direct you to the to the the grave site, which is kind of out of the way, but um, not too far from from Cross Creek, so I think it's it's probably closer than the Citrus Cemetery where Marjorie really wanted to be buried. But her um, but her grave is often strewn with um, people will leave pens and pencils 
and little vignettes. Um, I know often, Bambi. I, I've seen little Bambis Bambi. there. Yes, there's a little bit. There's a little deer statue that somebody left there that that gets replaced every few years after it gets weather beaten, etc. Um, I've seen uh, little shot glasses with glasses with a little bit of bourbon in them that were left there. Um, people <laughs> toasting her memory as well. So. Well, I think that uh, she was also frustrated in uh, terms of what she wanted to happen to her home. Uh, as I recall from the will, uh, <clears throat> and it was deemed precatory, that she wanted um, graduate students studying English literature at the University of Florida to live there. And indeed, for a short while that happened, uh, one of my friends, Jesse Hill Ford, and his wife, he had come here to study under Andrew Lytle to get a master's degree. And they and their two children lived in the house while he was studying here uh, for whatever reason. And uh, uh, I'm not sure it uh, was closed. Uh, but uh, once again, it's hard to control beyond the, <laughs> the grave. So. Uh, now it's a state park. Uh, questions? You've left them speechless, Flo. There is a request. Do send me the information and links to the, the um, events, and I'll be happy to share them with our members. Oh, sure. Um, uh, I, I, can, I can send you the flyer. I have it in PDF, and I'm not sure I can just drop it in the messages, but but I will send it to your email. Is that okay? That's perfect. And, and then I can. Um, and you can distribute it to whoever whoever wants to. And yeah, the links are on there in any case on the on the PDF. So you can um, you can share that. Thanks for the question. Questions? No, no questions. Well, you're missing your opportunity to uh, get your questions answered from the expert. But um, thank you so much, Flo, for being with us today. And thanks to all of you, both in the room and at home, for being with us. And we will conclude this mini-series next week with a showing of the yearling uh, because of the 75th anniversary of the premiere uh, of that uh, wonderful but <laughs> sad movie. <laughs> uh, I always cry. <laughs> I, I was given the book um, for Christmas soon after it came out, uh, and uh, I read the book, and I thought, why would anybody give a child <laughs> this book to read? Uh, <laughs> so the... the the sad ending hasn't changed over the years, I don't think. So again, yeah, thank I, you for I, being with yeah. the, um, the yearling was, Marjorie never thought of the yearling as a children's book. She thought of it as a book about a boy. It's a car, coming of age. I think it's a classic of American literature, but in, it became, somehow it became uh, you know, a book to give to children. And she always chafed against that characterization of the book as, as children's literature. And I think it, it resonates more with older people. If, you know, if it's a teen coming of age, the kind of thing, but more, I think, with the, um, with, with adults in the adult audience. The movie is also not a children's movie. The movie is very sentimental. Um, it was done during World War II, um, came out at the end of the war when, um, when, you know, women's roles were paid close attention to the role that, um, that Jane Wyman plays, where she becomes, uh, Ma Baxter becomes softened quite a bit at the end of the movie, whereas it's not so much so in the actual book. So comparing the book and the movie, it's very much a come home to home and hearth and a reconciliation 
with uh, gender roles at the end of World War II and the message of women get back into your kitchens, out of the factories and back into the kitchens, um, a tenderness for the mother child relationship. Um, and uh, very much that message comes across, especially in the final scenes of the movie. So pay attention to that, if you will, um, to look for that kind of um, subtext, if you will, with the, um, with, the, uh, with the movie. That's very helpful background for our uh, viewing of it next week. So thank you, Flo. And yes, again, sure. thank you for being with us. All right. Be well, everyone. Thank you, you too.